Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, I'm uh, Merit Jano, Dean of the School of International and Public Affairs, and it's my enormous pleasure to welcome you for the fall 2018 George Ball Lecture, uh, fe featuring um, remarks by SIPA's George Ball Adjunct Professor, Ambassador Rao. The Ball Lecture is one of our most important high-profile lectures given by a visiting faculty member who holds the George Ball Professorship. It was established in 2009 to support an adjunct faculty member who has demonstrated a record of thoughtful and innovative contributions to international understanding and a proven ability to apply these qualities uh, in ways that will support teaching and our students. As you know, George Ball was a remarkable establishment figure, a senior leader, uh, who spoke truth as he saw it. And in the spirit of George Ball um, uh, is, is an important spirit to acknowledge. You know, he served as Under Secretary of State in the Kennedy and Johnson administration, um, uh, came uh, to dissent from Cold War orthodoxies, especially during the early stages of America's involvement in, in Vietnam but really came to stand for and be an exemplar of reasoned, loyal opposition uh, during an era when the pressures for conformity of thought around that U.S. foreign policy uh, venture were very much upon him. So we've had some remarkable visitors as George Ball professors, uh, including Jorge Castaneda, who was the f um, foreign minister of Mexico, Les Gelb of the Council on Foreign Relations, Mari Pangestu, former Minister of Trade from uh, Indonesia, Kishore Mabubani, uh, longtime diplomat uh, from Singapore. And today's topic, the complex relationship between India and China, would be, I know, of enormous interest to George Ball if he were here today, uh, who thought so much about international relations and was uh, deeply interested in Asia. We're at a hugely important moment, I think, in, in relations with East and Southeast Asia, and we're deeply grateful to have had Ambassador Rao with us uh, this semester. She has had a truly remarkable career, which spanned more than four decades as a diplomat and senior official in India. She has said that her dream from the age of 12 was to join the Indian Foreign Service. She took the civil service examination, came out at the very top, and I believe joined uh, the service at about age 21 or some, some such age. She's had numerous um, important assignments in the Foreign Service. She was India's first woman spokesman, um, the first high commissioner uh, from her country to Sri Lanka, the first woman ambassador to the People's Republic of China. She served it as India's Foreign Secretary from 2009 and 11, and after that was appointed as India's Ambassador to the United States, a term she served for two years. And upon her retirement from active diplomatic service, she entered the world uh, of uh, academia with an appointment as the Miran Vikram Gandhi Fellow at the Indian Initiative at Brown University and she's pursued a variety of academic interests, teaching undergraduate seminars, graduate seminars, including one this semester at SIPA called India's China Relationship from Coexistence to Contest to Competition. She served as a visiting scholar at other academic institutions, received numerous honorary degrees, and, has, and is in that wonderful uh, tradition of the Renaissance person, both a poet and a musician, uh, releasing her first commercial album in 2017, I understand, which is available on iTunes India, and a book of poems, uh, Rain Rising in 2004, which I greatly admire. And I know she said of her diplomatic service, I became a diplomat because of my curiosity about the world around me, about history, both ancient and current, and the manner in which I was impacted by the spirit of a newly independent India. I'm very grateful that you're here with us today. I thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on dream catching. Can India and China be friends? 
please join me in welcoming Ambassador Ra. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean Jano, uh, distinguished faculty members and guests, dear friends, and students. I see some of them here, too. It is uh, truly a privilege to be before you today to deliver the George Ball Lecture, as it has also been a great privilege and an honor to be the George W. Ball Adjunct Professor at Columbia this fall. In recent days, I've come to understand in a much deeper fashion what an extraordinarily fine diplomat and public servant George Ball was and how uncommonly prescient he was about critically important global issues of his time. I'm speaking particularly of Vietnam and Iran. He was an intellectual gladiator in many ways fond of quoting, since he was a student of literature, fond of quoting T.S. Eliot, those famous lines of how, and I quote, we had the experience but missed the meaning, which can apply to so many situations that face countries in their domestic and foreign policies and on issues of national security. More than in the power of cold iron, you remember those lines from Kipling, and military strength and power, George Ball believed in the power of diplomacy, of clear communication, of moral leadership, and firm adherence to principle, of moral muscle, the essence of what a strong, prudent, respected, literate, and principled diplomat should be as Arthur Schlesinger Jr. once said. Schlesinger also called Ball the urbane iconoclast, and it is my belief that urbane iconoclasm should define the path or the art of path-setting diplomacy. The topic of my lecture today is somewhat of a decoy. Dream catching comes from the Native American culture. Good dreams are caught and then allowed to percolate into your inner being and bring benefit, while the bad dreams are captured in the web of the dream catcher and destroyed in the first rays of sunlight. Dream catching in diplomacy may be unsustainable in many ways, because while politicians may indulge in the rhetoric of dreams and visionary renditions of the past and the future that lies ahead, the public servant diplomat makes his or her pilgrimage in the present day, dealing with current crises, continuing negotiations, and shaping policy responses to pressing issues. And before I speak to you, I just wanted to do a little bit of show and tell. And I'm going to just take you through the slides that we have here. I'm kind of giving you uh, an overview of the impactors on this relationship and the personalities who have informed the narrative of what I'm going to speak of. From friendship to alienation, to our current day interaction. So here you have Rabindranath Tagore, the famous Nobel poet laureate of India. He won the Nobel Prize in 1912, and he had a long association with China, visiting there a couple of times in the 20s, and then setting up the famous China House, China Bhavan, as it's called, in West Bengal in the University of Shantiniketan. And what would interest you to know is during China's civil war and during the Japanese 
uh, invasion of China in the 1930s and 40s, many Chinese intellectuals made their way to India and went to Bengal, to China Bhavan, to Tagore's institution. And one of them was the famous Chinese artist Xu Pei Hong. And he painted this wonderful picture of Tagore while literally in exile in China, in India, in 1940. So it's, a, it's quite a historic picture that hangs today in China Bhavan in Shantiniketan. Shantiniketan incidentally means house of peace. Prabodh Chandra Bhakchi was one of our earliest modern sinologists. He died in 1956, but he contributed tremendously to the understanding of Chinese culture in India and Indian culture in China. And his parting words to his, uh, uh, to his Chinese friends was to quote these lines from one of the ancient Chinese uh, Indian pilgrims in China. And this is what those lines from a poet living, uh, a pilgrim, a monk living thousands of years ago. These are the words. To friends in China, to show that we are not forgetful, the road is long, so do not mind the smallness of the present. We wish you may accept it. So in a, in a way, the present in India-China relations has a smallness to it, which I shall elucidate in my lecture. And this is a picture of the great trigonometrical survey of India, which the British undertook in the late 18th and in the 19th centuries. And the words here, the words here, Aa Setu Himachalam, uh, is, they're important because they, in a way, express, as I should say in my speech, the idea of India from the southern shores adjacent to the coasts of Sri Lanka, you can see that right down there in the map, to the northernmost point where India essentially is crowned by the Himalayas. So when we say in Sanskrit, Asetu Himachalam, it means from the southern sea, from uh, the Pork Strait that separates India from Sri Lanka to the Himalayas, something like when Americans say to, from sea to shining sea. I've used this image of an Indian Buddhist temple in Luoyang because in a way it's connected to my title on dream catching. Because Luoyang is the site of the famous White Horse Temple. Uh, I think a lot of you who have been to China know the Pei Master Temple. And it was uh, set up by, at the time of the Eastern Han Emperor who had this dream of a great prince being born in India who was preaching a new religion. And then he sent his emissaries to the frontier lands, the borderlands with India to search for this new phenomenon. And they brought back two Buddhist monks from India to Loyang. And the monastery, the White Horse Monastery was essentially set up at that time. Ten years ago, the Indian government committed to building an Indian-style Buddhist temple in Luoyang, which was inaugurated in 2010. And so this is the temple, the Indian temple at the site of the White Horse Temple in Luoyang. These are more <coughs> pictures from there. And an extraordinary uh, picture from 1956, when Indians and Chinese still call themselves brothers. You have a picture of India's first Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru and Premier Zhou Enlai at a New Year party. The first time one has seen them in, in uh, being masked. They always said, they always say that, uh, you know, you always wear a mask at many of these formal occasions, and this is literally so. And this is a Chinese magazine cover from the 1950s showing. This is in typical, you know, early uh, Chinese communist uh, art showing children with an Indian elephant gifted by Prime Minister Nehru. It's an old cover, magazine cover. And then we come to the war of 1962, which has been indented in the Indian psyche till today. Very few people in China remember it, but, you know, 1962 is sort of 
cut into most of our minds, and we remember it vividly even today. So here are some pictures of you know some takeaways from that period. This is the f picture of the famous Battle of Rezangla uh, in the western sector of the India-China border, where Indian and Chinese troops fought each other in Ladakh. And the Indians were cut down to the last man. Um, an Indian general once told me that he called it India's Tamapale. And everybody, every soldier who was defending the Indian post fell in that, in that battle. And their bodies were recovered only after the winter snows had melted. And they were there in their positions when they were discovered. Uh, you know, the dead bodies were discovered six months later. So this is the war memorial at Rosangla. And this is the inscription on the war memorial. To the sacred memory of the heroes of Rizangla, 114 martyrs of 13 Kumaon, that's a regiment, who fought to the last man, last round, against hordes of Chinese on 18th November 1962, built by all ranks. This is what I said about the dead soldiers being found in trenches still holding on to their weapons. A mortar man died with a bomb still in his hand. The medical orderly had a syringe and bandage in his hands when the Chinese bullets, bullet hit him. It's another war memorial in Tawang in the eastern sector in the disputed uh, state from the Chinese side of Arunachal Pradesh. It is very much a part of India today. But the very fierce battle was, bought, was fought in Tawang also in 1962. And the Chinese actually occupied it for some time. And this is a, just a map to illustrate the dispute along our 3,488 kilometer long uh, boundary with China. A little in miles, I suppose that would be about 2,200 miles or so. And uh, you have the disputed sectors here. Uh, in the north, this is called the western sector of the border. This is the middle sector, the central sector. This is the Sikkim sector. And this is Arunachal Pradesh, you know, where the famous McMahon line essentially draws the boundary between India and China, or India and the Tibet Autonomous Region of China. And that's where the town of Tawang is, where I spoke of the military memorial just now. Famous visit by Rajiv Gandhi to Beijing in 19, 1988, in a sense, set the tone for what we did, uh, India and China together, for almost for 30 years. Uh, it's been 30 years since that visit. But as I will tell you in my remarks, uh, it's not not as uh, set as it has been all these 30 years. Things are changing, times are changing. It's a picture of cosmopol, I just picked this up from the net, uh, cosmological communism. So imperial thought and Marxist ideology shape China's policy making today. So it's the whole thing about, you know, the Belt and Road, the community of shared destiny, and uh, what the United Front Department, Work Department does, and Xi Jinping at the center of it all. And here's a picture of Prime Minister Modi, Prime Minister of the world's largest democracy, and his various initiatives to make India great. And he's been to Beijing. It's the world's most populous selfie. And here he is with the terracotta warriors in Xi'an. Looks quite impressive. And so Diwali, like Christmas here, is made in China. We have Diwali, as you know, is one of our premier festivals. We, we import a lot of consumer goods of all varieties from China today, like you do here. So the spirit of Diwali is celebrated with a lot of Chinese fireworks. Uh, we, 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 you know, a lot of fireworks are burst during 
Diwali, is the festival of lights. So Xiaomi, Xiaomi, t uh, the cell phone maker, I mean, their phones are very popular. Uh, and you know, Indians have taken to not only cellular phones, but smartphones in a big way. And that's how, many, in many cases, how they access the internet and the World Wide Web. So you see, there is a Chinese connection here. And people love these phones. But I'll show you the next slide. It's from the Indian Air Force, which says, don't use Xiaomi phones. So you see that, you know, you see this kind of illustrates the, the ambivalence with which mo many of us view China. And some two recent tweets, India and China recently drew in a football match uh, two days ago. And uh, when India and China tried to out e outdo each other on the foot football pitch, Messi be very afraid. And uh, we played, they played, it was a 0-0 draw, warm up for the Asian Cup. And uh, so it, it was a game of billions, as somebody said. And this is also a week when India and China announced that they would co-train 10 Afghan diplomats, uh, a joint training program. And these 10 diplomats have come to Delhi under the aegis of a trilateral cooperation program between India, China, and Afghanistan. So, so we can go back to the final. So that's, that's as far as the slides go. And I shall now start with my remarks. So do you want to put the original slide? India and China are neighbors, as you know, and close ones at that. China's southwestern borders run contiguously with the Indian subcontinent, with the Karakorams and the Himalayas in between. The Chinese call these mountains the Himalayas just as we Indians do, although for us the Himalayas are a significant constituent of the definition of our nationhood. I just mentioned the motto of the Survey of India, the national organization that makes our maps, Our Setu Himachalam, which defines the idea of India stretching from the southern tip of peninsular India to the majestic heights of the Himalaya, as deeply emotive as your concept of sea to shining sea. Yet, India and China are more adversaries than friends, despite the fact that we are such close neighbors. There is a mutual wariness about our relationship. Despite the muffled footsteps of history that speak of a millennial friendship between the two countries, of the Eastern Han Emperor who dreamt of a great religious figure being born in the Western paradise, which is how ancient Chinese referred to India, and ordering that the teachings of this figure, the Buddha, be brought to Luoyang in the Chinese heartland to create a famous white horse temple there, the current reality speaks differently. The fact is that as the second decade of the 21st century draws to a close and the world tries to cope with the advancing tide of Chinese strategic ambition in Asia and around the world, India sees her relationship with China as growingly as growing increasingly complex, contested, and competitive. References to harmony and coexistence seem to be somewhat out of place, even if the sporadic Prime Minister Modi-President Xi summits seem to embellish their communiques with these terms. We are neighbors, but we are imperfect neighbors, and the nearness of geography cannot bridge our geopolitical differences. Last year, in the summer of 2017, we saw the unfolding crisis of Chinese and Indian troops confronting each other at Doklam, a high mountain plateau in a third country, in Bhutan, near the border with Tibet. That crisis taught us that, for all the talk of building common ground and strengthening cooperation, Despite unresolved boundary disputes, talk that had prevailed for three decades, as I just mentioned, 
the edifice of bilateral relations was developing serious cracks and showing its constructional flaws. China, as an advancing power, had ambitions that would inevitably clash with a re-emergent giant like India. And there would be no doubt that the future of the Indo-Pacific would essentially be defined by the tensions and pressures created by the operation of Chinese power and influence and the latter's threat to a rule-based international order. It is obvious that for the democracies of the Indo-Pacific, the essentially non-transparent and unprecedented advance of China necessitates a long-term strategic vision. That vision not only needs conceptualization, but also its operationalization cannot be indefinite. In the mid 20th century, when India and China were newly emergent, newly independent or liberated nations, together they put together the principles of peaceful coexistence that should define relations between countries. This was a bliss was it in that dawn to be alive moment. Today, the hashtag of peaceful coexistence to define the relationship may seem rather maudlin or utopian. Will China peacefully coexist with Asia except on her own terms? Her neighbors are definitely apprehensive. Even in Pakistan, the country that the Chinese refer to as their iron brother, the inordinate debt burdens placed on the country by the ongoing execution of the CPEC project have been difficult to ignore in the political space of the new government of Prime Minister Imran Khan. The Chinese dream that an aspirational China seeks today under President Xi Jinping includes the ambition to reshape the strategic landscape of Asia, the Indian Ocean, and Europe through the Belt and Road Initiative with life-altering implications for countries en route. In terms of development, it is true, certainly life-altering, but also in terms of what that future will look like. China is shaping the geopolitics of our century on its terms, and many smaller nations have been overwhelmed by the consequences. The example of Sri Lanka, whose Hambantota port story is a parable of how the Chinese came, saw, and conquered for our times. In the last few weeks, we've been seeing important policy statements from the United States on how the time has come to redefine and redraw policy towards China, and how the patterns of engagement of the last four decades with that country have long passed their use by date. This is a new era of great power competition as the US national security strategy released last December termed it. In our own region, the Japanese were the first to speak of a free and open Asia Pacific. And voices in support of the concept have become much more definitive in articulation today. The concept takes as its underpinning a rule-based strategic and dis dispute resolution architecture, freedom of navigation, unhindered maritime passage, and ensuring that the sea lanes through which much of the world's trade passes today between East and West are not prey to militarization and the threat of force. Vice President, US Vice President Pence, in a recent speech, spoke of the ways in which China has sought to advance its strategic interests across the world with growing intensity and sophistication and how the United States had been negatively impacted by the operations of Chinese policy in diverse spheres. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has said that a free Indo-Pacific, and this term has passed into common parlance now, including the renaming of the Pacific uh, Naval Command of the United States at the Indo-Pacific Naval Command. He said, Mike Pompeo said, that a free Indo-Pacific means that all nations should be able to protect their sovereignty from coercion by other countries, and that at the national level, 
free means good governance and the assurance that citizens can enjoy fundamental rights and liberties. Territorial and maritime disputes must be resolved peacefully and all nations should enjoy open access to seas and airways. The message is very clear. The Chinese record in the region has not met the test of these requirements of transparency and conformity with internationally accepted rules of functioning. There was a time in the past, it truly seems like a dream now, when Indians and Chinese referred to themselves as brothers. That kind of brotherhood is a bridge too far today. Of course, the dramatic progress made by China in the last three decades has left India behind when you apply the strict yardstick of GDP growth, development of infrastructure, size of the economy, military budgets, technological strides, and equipment modernization. Nonetheless, I would submit that India's strengths as a billion strong democracy, its management of diversity and plurality, its steadily advancing economic capacity, its open society, give it the luster in areas where China cannot be a competitor. The uniqueness of India's example makes a powerful statement in Asia and the free world. In recent days, China has called upon India to create with China a collective opposition to unilateral trade protectionism, as they term it, by the United States. Such Chinese overtures may not move India very much given the fact that we have a yawning trade deficit with China and efforts to get the Chinese to open up their markets to Indian goods have not yielded meaningful dividend. The brotherhood phase in our relations with China, the dream sequence in our relations, as you can call it, ended in the run-up to the border conflict of 1962 and was buried in the battlefields that you just saw of that short but bitterly fought campaign. In middle-class India, the memories of that war have not faded, even though India and China have maintained peace on their borders for over four decades now, with no exchange of fire, despite the transgressions of the line of actual control that get reported in the media from time to time. But the confrontation over Doklam, I just spoke about it last year, gave India a full exposure to the Chinese playbook on territorial disputes in a graphic manner. The Chinese way is to first enforce physical presence in a disputed area and follow it up with threats of coercion, claim she has all the legal right to be present in the territory in dispute, and raise the temperature by inflammatory rhetoric in the media. And this has been brought out very clearly by uh, strategic analysts like Oriana Schuyler Mastro. But unlike in the case of those countries who have maritime disputes with China in the South China Sea, India was not coerced and stood up to China. The Chinese aim could also have been to generate strains and pressure on India's relations with Bhutan, perhaps the most important of our bilateral relationships. Prime Minister Modi made a visit to Wuhan earlier this year in a trip that was billed as a reset of relations with China. The atmospherics of the visit were cordial, but this continues to be, in my view, a relationship in therapy after Doklam. Long years ago, Jawaharlal Nehru, India's first prime minister, who is incidentally perennially accused of having been soft on China, told a group of Indians embarking on a visit to China, and this was in 1952, that the challenge between India and China, and these were his words, the challenge between India and China runs across the spine of Asia. You couldn't accuse him of being soft when he said this. For most Indians, that continues to be the challenge. India obviously needs to leverage her being different from China more effectively openness, transparency of functioning in the region, promoting the idea of South Asia as an integer, 
with India being willing to provide non-reciprocal advantages in trade and connectivity to smaller neighbors, dealing with the asymmetries of power and influence created by China through better neighborhood relationships, efficient delivery of development assistance and capacity building in democratic governance, the deployment of maritime strength and capability, and deepening relations with the US, Japan, Australia, and the ASEAN countries are all important and integrative requirements in this process. At the same time, an open breach in relations with China, barring a serious disruption caused by military conflict, is not visualized. India has its own national growth strategy to pursue and fulfill, and an increasingly aspirational young population whose livelihood needs must be met. Our northern borders are unquiet, and the Pakistan relationship is troublesome enough. The trade and investment links with China, as they have grown over the years, indicate how evolved this relationship has become. China is our largest trading partner in goods. Some 20,000 young Indians study in China, in China today. The two countries constantly interact and share common interests in many multilateral forums and are involved in the building and strengthening of new coalitions of shared interest like the BRICS, the New Development Bank, and the Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank. India has never, nevertheless to be extremely dexterous in approaching the developing situation in the Indo-Pacific as tensions fueled by China's rise and its actions create a backlash backed by the United States. The strategic and indispensable, as it is called, partnership with the United States that India has today is the most important of our foreign policy relationships in many, in, in many ways, in many senses, both on the global and regional stage. When you are posited against what are hegemonic aspirations of a new power in the region, what are seen as hegemonic aspirations, that is, I'm referring to China, a China that is also non-democratic, there is strength and reason to work with other democracies in the region, and particularly the United States, which is an Indo-Pacific country, to meet this challenge, to paraphrase Nehru, across the spine of Asia. But India's China relationship will continue to be crucial to its future well-being. Our tryst with destiny, to borrow another phrase from Nehru, at the dawn of Indian independence in 1947, will essentially be a race against China. It will require a considerable amount of creative diplomacy to calibrate a reset in relations that recognizes that the structure of bilateral relations created over the last 30 years following the 1988 visit of Rajiv Gandhi, he saw the picture to Beijing, has lost considerable sheen and usefulness. The territorial dispute with China remains unresolved. The China-Pakistan relationship is a much more aggravated source of concern. China's South Asia strategy directly dilutes and undercuts India's interests in the region. And I'm afraid there is no real empathy between the two countries. That ecosystem of scholarly contact, educational exchange, tourism flows, mutual understanding and sensitivity, so vital for better understanding, is, I'm afraid, underdeveloped. underdeveloped. Most importantly, China and India are not the countries they were in 1988 when Rajiv Gandhi made that historic visit. While the structures put in that put in place at that time to manage the relationship have not collapsed. The world today is also a very different place. China's impending, threatened, what call it what you will, dominance of the region we live in requires our policymakers to return to their drawing boards. India also needs to leverage its connectivities with Southeast Asia more effectively through an intensification of its Act East policy. The northeastern states of India, which are naturally linked to Southeast Asia through ties of history, ethnicity, custom, and tradition, as also geography, and the Andaman and Nicobar Islands in the Bay of Bengal should be key catalysts in this regard. The Andaman and Nicobar Islands 
ladies and gentlemen, are, are very, very close uh, to the islands of Indonesia, very, very close. The strategic importance of the latter, I'm referring to the Nicobar Islands particularly, needs leveraging to our advantage. India has to orient her strategic thinking more purposefully to focus on the defense of her coastline, which is both an asset and a vulnerability, if you remember your colonial history. You remember how Vasco da Gama discovered India, or as one historian put it, how India discovered Vasco da Gama. Her vulnerabilities have to be transformed into assets through improvements in infrastructure, business friendliness, speed in execution of projects, and deepening strategic tie-ups with partners like Japan and Singapore. Today, even more than her mountain frontiers, India's coastal installations and harbors are her front line. And unlike China, as far as India's maritime frontiers go, she is not faced with dilemmas posed by island chains. Her Nicobar Islands have the capacity, as one of our historians said long ago, to control entry into the Gulf of Sumatra and the Malacca Straits. The challenge before India is how it converts its resources into more effective influence in Asia. Her diplomatic influence must be energized through intelligent choices of non-allied defense partnerships, networks of economic relationships which deliver in terms of process and execution, a sophisticated projection of soft power, and being that model for inclusive, rule-based, and tolerant democratic good governance. We can spread a lot of sunlight around, I'm sure. India must be prepared to be a serious competitor to China in promoting its interests in the Indo-Pacific, understanding that, as Matt Pottinger of the US National Security Council said recently, referring to China and the United States, that competition will be at the forefront of the relationships we have, both the United States and India, with China as time goes by. In conclusion, to return to the theme of our lecture today, can India and China be friends? My answer would be a very qualified no, I'm afraid. A no because of the terrain of the relationship today, strewn as it is with complexities and sources of friction like the unresolved border dispute, as well as our competition for regional influence, particularly in South Asia, and China's perceived reluctance, and I'm talking of the Indian public when I'm saying this, China's perceived reluctance to support a greater voice for India in global governance. But neighbors cannot turn their backs on each other. So even as India must be the example of a responsible, cooperative, democratic, global presence that China is not, and must build strong, well-functioning partnerships with the United States and Japan particularly, it should avoid the path of direct confrontation with China. We certainly cannot afford to sleepwalk into confrontation with China, as an article in the Washington Post, a John Pomfret article said recently with reference to the United States and China. Tensions with China cannot be eliminated but the two countries must maintain a steady and stable equilibrium in their relationship. An over 2,000 mile long unsettled border, the largest territorial dispute left to be resolved in the world, is a constant reminder of how easily disturbed this relationship can be at very short notice. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, I would submit the real world dominates the dream world in India's China relationship. Thank you. Well, it's been said about diplomacy that is life without maps. So it's very difficult for me to chart a precise course on where this relationship would be headed. I would say that, you know, dreams of utopia are certainly ruled out as far as the future is concerned. And my talk tried to illustrate how, you know, the reemergence of both these countries, and China has fully reemerged, I think, now, and India is reemerging, uh, has, in, has had led to a lot of tensions being generated, competition coming to the fore, 
even if we have avoided conflict. So when you look at the future and ask me to chart a vision for this relationship, I would say engagement is definitely necessary. We can't turn our backs on each other. I think our leaders and our in institutions and our establishments, and most of all, the public, in the public domain, there has to be much more interaction. That is what you see in America. America's interaction with China is so rich and multi-textured. We do not have that between India and China. And one has to come to understand why this has been that way and how we can ameliorate that situation. Thank you. In the back, please. Now in, called Act East. Yeah, now called Act East, right. Um, sort of in relation to that, we see China expanding into a lot of African regions, a lot of East Asian regions economically. So they'll often fund um, you know, exploration of natural resources, so on and so forth. So how do you think India is falling behind in its relations with these quote unquote smaller countries and instead focusing on countries like the US and Russia? So how do you think that's um, affecting us in a negative way? I, uh, first of all, let me say I don't believe it has ever been a tenet of Indian foreign policy to neglect our neighbors, uh, as you call them, our smaller neighbors. I suppose it would be diplomatic to refer to them in so many words. But the fact is, I said that in my speech, we, uh, we need this definition of, for instance, the South Asian commons. I've always advocated that but because the Indian subcontinent, uh, what we call South Asia today, before partition and during the days of the Raj, it was the Indian subcontinent. Very integrated, economically integrated, connected through transportation links. All those have been severed uh, as a result of current history, as it were. So we need, uh, you know, we need to think of South Asia collectively as a whole, so that we are much better integrated economically and regionally. And that is the direction that perhaps we have not gone down as energetically as we should have in past years. And the advent of China in our region has in, in many ways opened our eyes to some of these very, uh, what shall I say, uh, unaddressed realities. And, uh, but let me also say that with, us, with our neighbors in South Asia, and I would put Pakistan in a different category given the very complex nature of our relationship with Pakistan. But with all of our other South Asian neighbors, I think we've had a productive uh, dialogue, interaction, people-to-people uh, -people connectivity, and political understanding. And I think, in, you know, in many ways, India is the, uh, you know, where the the, the place of first resort for many of our neighbors. You look at the tsunami when it happened in Sri Lanka. Uh, it was the Indian Navy and the Indian uh, aid, uh, you know, the, the assistance givers who were, who were the first to arrive to provide the assistance and, and address you know, the difficulties of the people. So in that sense, those links are, are you know, organic links that cannot be severed. So we're not neglecting, to, answer, uh, to address your point, we're not neglecting our neighbors uh, and you know, just having good relations with the US or Japan or some of the larger you know, democracies in our region. That is not really, that is not our intention and never was. I think the neighborhood first policy has always been a tenet of our foreign policy. I'm seeing now lots of questions. Let me just collect a couple, if I may, and sure. then let you uh, have some concluding remarks, starting back there. Mm -hmm. my, my question is regarding the <coughs> conflict in the South China, China Sea, and it's with respect to that India's growing a strong relationship with the United States. What do you see as India's option when it comes to South China Sea conflict and India-China relationship? Mm -hmm. And the last one. Thank you for a very thorough uh, 
presentation. I'm particularly interested in the moment, it seems to me, that when Prime Minister Modi came to power, there was a different kind of uh, relationship that was attempted. And it seems to have changed in the four years. And that part of that change seems to be also China's attitude towards India. That while we still continue to say we need to have, we meaning India, continues to have this feeling of wanting a stronger bilateral cultural connections, other connections, but that whether China has an interest in creating even a strengthening of connection, never mind friendship, is there. It seems like something has changed, and I would love for you to comment on where China's perception of India is today. I'll start with Vishaka's question and then. Okay, I think Dr. Desai has also. Um, I think I think we, these three? I, I think we are running short of time, so let's just collect the last questions and then let her okay. conclude. So, okay, he has the microphone, so we'll let him speak okay. briefly. Sure. Um, uh, thanks, um, uh, Dr. Rao. Uh, I the question that I had was uh, sort of related to the uh, speech that Mike Pence had given uh, last week. So and and referring also to what the to the lecture that you just gave now, where you spoke about the 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 sort of uh, highlight the the good aspects that I that India has where it comes to open economy and democracy, um, looking at both of those speeches and especially how they've been perceived, uh, one narrative that has come out that has been propagated from China is how democracy doesn't work, and they use the Trump election uh, the election of Donald Trump to highlight that and, and to amplify that. Um, in, a, in, a, in envisioning a strategy or a, or a policy towards China from an India and US perspective, what is the way, how can, how can India and the US counter that narrative where democracy is being uh, you know, pushed down because of popular, populism? Thank you, and uh, for the last comment from, uh, Professor Desai, so you're hearing a bit from our community of the reactions to yes, your ideas. Yes. Well, the, the Chinese economy is not doing well. It grew at 10% uh, in the um, years of 1970s to 1990s. Today, growing at 5.5% to 6% GDP growth rate. Uh, the one-child policy has now cut back on the labor force of China. Wages have gone up. And so the economy is, in, in my view, uh, considerably serious uh, problems. Will that uh, constrain China's territorial and um, other advances and aspirations in the Himalayan and the Pacific region? Thank you. Okay. So we'll start with Professor Desai's point and try to remember the rest. <laughs> um, I think uh, China's. Um, you know, desire to buttress its territorial claims and advance those claims uh, is not going to go away that easily, despite, you know, the fact that growth has slowed down. And they have numerous, I suppose, structural constraints that they face internally when it comes to the, the, the progression in the years ahead. And uh, which is also how, why you see this whole, somebody called it, as a, it put it in German, Drang nach Western, <laughs> not Drang nach Osten, but Drang nach Western, pressure towards the West and opening up, you know, these, the Belt and Road and, uh, you know, and also the rise of nationalism within China. It's sort of fueled, in, you know, whole generations of young Chinese are growing up you know, reading about lost territories and how they have to be regained. And this fire that has been lit under, you know, those feelings will be difficult to put out. And I think the regime will be constantly under pressure to show how they are defending the Chinese interests. So I don't see that going away. I don't see claims being canceled out or China coming to the negotiating table, you know, with the view that let's settle these things in a spirit of give and take. I think in our own case with China on the territorial issues, I personally think their positions have hardened over the years and not 
in any way being diluted. So that's to answer your question. On Vishaka's point about you know, the lack of Chinese, um, the kind of neglect of India in many ways. You know, the fact is that an average Chinese uh, knows about the Buddhist connection and you know, this whole thing about the silk route, I mean essentially it's called, a, why is it called a silk route? It was essentially a route on which there was a great traffic of ideas between India and China. And that traffic of ideas is not there anymore. I think we need, uh, why is it not there? I think between the US and China, again, there is a traffic of ideas. But somehow India has existed in some mind's shadow, in some kind of rain shadow, as we say, as far as the Chinese are concerned. And then, of course, you have the question of Tibet. And, you know, I didn't talk about it, but you know, for, a, for the Chinese on the street, I mean, they think of the Dalai Lama, the fact that he's in exile in, in India, never mind why he's there, but you know, they have this impression about India somehow being involved in it, which is not the case. So um, popular culture, Bollywood, of course, is quite popular. I wish they would import more Bollywood films, but there's a limit to the numbers that they, they import every year. The, India is not studied sufficiently in Chinese schools or universities. There are a few India centers, India studies centers, a few India scholars. But I can't think of a scholar of the stature of Qi Xian Lin, who died in 2009, who was such a towering Indologist, a Chinese Indologist, who in fact coined the famous phrase that India-China relations were created in heaven but constructed on earth. And you see how the construction of earth has not been as good as we want it to be. Uh, about, um, uh, I think you had the point about Sri Lanka. Yes. Uh, nothing to do with China, you said, no? It's more about the India-Sri Lanka relationship? China, India, Canada, Sri Lanka. China. Well, Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka should answer that question. Where does it fit in in the India-China paradigm? Because, you know, you decided to have the Chinese build, build the coal-fired power plant at Norochulai. And then you had the Hambantota port being constructed. And today, you've leased it out for 99 years. Uh, where does that leave you, is the question. And uh, has it been a good experience for Sri Lanka? As a Sri Lankan, you would have to answer that question. I think that um, the whole manner in which this uh, you know, construction sort of tsunami undertaken by the Chinese in our region where does it leave the neighborhood in terms of, was it done transparently? What were the financial rules under which it was done? Uh, has it you know, put an inordinate debt burden on these countries, which is a fact? I think these are all questions that are coming up now after you know, the operation has been completed. I think, uh, it's not, I think for Sri Lanka, it can't be a happy situation. Even, you know, even if you, know, you are friends with China, have been friends for decades with China. But I don't believe the average Sri Lankan can feel you know, uh, sort of uh, complacent, let's say, about this. That's my view. As far as you said about the... Uh, well, that I don't think falls within the purview of uh, India-China India, China, Sri Lanka paradigm. Of course, it, that's, I'm glad you raised this point. The Chinese look at in the Maldives, you know, their support for the Yamin government, for instance. Or, I mean, they have traditionally tended uh, to be quite, uh, you know, uh, they don't seem to really care about the democratic credentials about the leader concerned. They go in, they get, they're looking for the support they need, the receptivity they, they want. And they're not looking at the political affiliations of the leader concerned, or whether he or she is democratic enough, and the upholding of civic rights, freedom of expression, all these things don't seem to matter to them, which is why I said the Indian model is so different. We may be very slow in the execution of projects, and you know, the Chinese score much better than us on that metric. But then, you know, uh, slow and steady perhaps wins the race. And uh, did I answer your point? It Sorry. was, uh, he was asking about, uh, you know, could India and the United States together kind of change the narrative yeah. about uh, the dysfunction of democracies? Well, There's the, a good invitation there. I, I think, think that's one of the planks 
of the strategic partnership, looking at how we as open democracies can do much more to uh, spread good standards of governance, uh, to build capacity, uh, you know, even if it's in the conduct of electri and fair elections, for instance. And uh, I, there's a lot that has been defined as within the realm of the possible when it comes to this. And I think India should be much more uh, willing and much more enthusiastic about doing this kind of advertisement for what democracy stands for and what India's experience has been and why democracy is the best form of governance. And that's the only way, I suppose, to, to in a sense, contrast the Chinese experience with us in the region we work in. Thank you very much. I wish we had more time. And South China Sea, I'm afraid, we're not involved in the conflict, but we have constantly advocated the need for a rule-based uh, negotiated settlement and the avoidance of coercion and the use of force. And the ASEAN has to be very much involved. There has to be a code of conduct when it comes to the resolution. You, you just can't go in and build new islands or you know, artificial islands, you know, which is what the Chinese have been doing, and ignore the, uh, the uh, rulings of the International Court of Arbitration, which again doesn't set a good precedent at all for the region. Thank you very much. It's been a wonderful provocation for an important area and much deeper thought by all of us. Please join me in thanking Ambassador Rao. Thank you. Thank you.